Good afternoon. I am Council Member Carlina Rivera, Chair of the City Council's Committee on Hospitals. During today's hearing, we will review New York City Health and Hospitals' $998 million fiscal 2020 operating budget, the 10-year capital improvement plan, as well as performance indicators from the fiscal 2020 preliminary mayor's management report. During a time when health care is constantly being attacked by the federal government, it is a relief to know that, the New York, that New York City understands the importance of access to affordable care, and I hope to hear in greater detail the plan for the rollout of NYC Care. I appreciate the sentiment behind this recent announcement and the good intentions of the program. However, I do not want to cause any further confusion in an already complex system, especially when we are looking to encourage the majority of Metro Plus enrollees who seek medical services at other institutions to encourage them to be consumers at our H&H &H facilities. I want to ensure that we are best utilizing our marketing efforts and funding to upgrade our centers and streamline processes to maximize the effect we can have on all New Yorkers. It will be up to us to bring H&H &H facilities up to their full potential. We must focus on patient numbers and outcomes while competing for the same dollars our private institutions do. And we all know how crucial a role health and hospitals play here in New York City, especially for our most vulnerable and marginalized citizens. So it saddens me that one major rating scale, the federal government's hospital compare service, has given the majority of our H&H &H facilities one out of five stars. In addition, the inpatient satisfaction rate is still at 62%. With the threat of a deficit looming in fiscal year 2021, I'm looking forward to hearing of steps taken to accomplish the goals of an ambitious agenda set forward last year. As we discussed in our oversight hearing on access to specialty care, it's vital that we make inclusion a priority as we make improvements to our facilities. Capital upgrades and training of staff should certainly be a priority in the next fiscal year and in the coming months, I plan to hold hearings on cultural competence, implicit bias training, resiliency efforts, cost savings of a new electronic records keeping system, and services for our immigrant and LGBTQ communities. Given these important issue topics, I'd like to take one moment to talk specifically about our LGBTQ New Yorkers, specifically access for our transgender and gender nonconforming populations. In the Committee on, on Health's preliminary budget hearing, a community member had the courage to speak up on a terrible experience they faced at one of our H&H &H facilities in the last year, one that could have been avoided with inclusive forms and an educated staff. Since this experience, I'm curious to know what H&H &H plans to do to ensure that all hospital forms include options and language that matches New York City's diversity and philosophies. I know how difficult it is to provide the absolute best care in a national political climate that is not inclusive in its proposals put forward and the anxiety that it causes so many of us. And I do want to thank you, Commissioner Katz, and the Health and Hospitals team for all of the great work that has been done so far and to say how much I look forward to seeing where else we can go from here. I want to thank my committee staff, Policy Analyst um, Emily Balkin, Finance Analyst Lauren Hunt, and Committee Counsel Zay Emanuel for their support over these last few months. And I'd like to call up the team at Health and Hospitals, Dr. Mitchell Katz, Matthew Siegler, John Ulberg, and Patsy Yang. Good afternoon, Chairperson. And with that, we're going to swear you all in. Ah, that's right. Thank you. Sorry. No, it's okay. If you all raise, raise your right hand, please. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Good afternoon, Chairperson Rivera, City Council members. Thank you so much for inviting us. I'm Mitch Katz, uh, the President and Chief executive officer of NYC Health and Hospitals. I'm so glad to be here to review the 2020 preliminary budget. It has been an amazing year, and I thank all of you for welcoming me back so warmly uh, to my hometown. Uh, and it's been great to take 30 years of California experience and, and put it to use in, in the place that I love the most. 
Uh, I think we've made a lot of progress on executing on the mayor's transformation plan. Uh, in line with that plan, we are on target to achieve 757 million in revenue generating initiatives and 430 million in expense reducing initiatives. Uh, through the quarter uh, two of this year, patient care revenue is up 80 million versus this time last year. And, uh, and you'll remember that last year we were 150 million above. So this is 80 on top of that 150 million. And this is not from patients. This is rather from their insurance. So that previously we were subsidizing insurance when we want that money to go for us. Uh, driven by improved billing, uh, and better performance on our value-based contracts. We're just 10 million short to what was a very ambitious target uh, we set for this year's budget. And I, I actually would have been disappointed if we hit our target. I would have felt that I had to not set for myself a hard enough target. Because uh, I always feel you want to stretch yourself. And the only way you can stretch yourself is to aim for more than you can do. While well, we've seen a decrease in inpatient utilization, which is a good thing. We're not, we don't want people to be in the hospital. We want people to be able to get the care they need in an outpatient setting. Hospitals should only be for people who need that level of care. Um, much of the decline comes from our value-based contracts, which means we get paid anyway, as we should. We're getting paid for keeping people out of the hospital, for providing them uh, with primary care. Uh, many of the important revenue initiatives are just getting off the ground, and we expect that when EPIC is fully implemented, it's going to significantly improve our revenue uh, beyond what I've reported to you. On the expense side, we're just uh, 25 million above our budget, and I would say that was also intentional. We heard after the budget was set a great deal of testimony before you and you supported on inadequate number of nurses in our facilities, preventing people from getting the care. And we've hired 340 net nurses, which were not anticipated. And so that's above and it's net because it, it allows for nurses to have retired or to move on. So we filled all of the positions where people left and then we hired 340 new nurses. Uh, so to me, that's money well spent. Uh, we also increased our investment in staff to do billing so that we can bring in these kinds of dollars that enable our system uh, to work well. Uh, how did we manage to do those, that level of investment without only being 25 million over our budget? We greatly reduced the number of temporary workers in our system. We eliminated consultants across the board and we made a, a large number of managerial staff uh, reductions. Um, a year ago was the first time that I was here. I was nervous. Uh, you were very kind to me. I appreciated that. Um, a year later, despite all of the uh, difficulties we have from the Trump administration, including some really awful statements about immigrants who are our neighbors and our patients, um, despite all of that, we've maintained a balanced budget and we're well positioned uh, for stability and success. By the end of 2021, we've built three new stop shop community health centers and we chose, as I mentioned in the previous hearing, I'm very proud that while other systems, when they choose where to build their centers, they look at the maps and figure out where are the areas that have the patients with the best insurance, so I'll put my clinic there. I know many uh, uh, systems that do that. We did just the opposite. We took the same maps and we said, where are the most uninsured patients? Where are the most patients who are out of care? That's where we want to put our clinics. Not where they have the best payment, but where people most uh, need us. Uh, we are invested in needed repairs and improvements, including a $52 million uh, planned capital investment at Metropolitan, and I want to thank Councilwoman Ayala for supporting that, for championing it, for getting us uh, additional money, as well as uh, to the mayor. Uh, other committee members have generously supported uh, Woodhall, and I, I appreciate um, that Councilmember Reynosa recently gave us money uh, for the emergency department at Woodhall, Elmhurst, uh, uh, 
Councilmember Mizell, Kings, Roberta Clemente, and many of our other uh, facilities. I also take uh, the chairwoman's point about there are other facilities that need infrastructure improvement. We're well aware and, and are working on it with OMB to make sure that all of our facilities are adequate. Uh, building on the Mayor's Get Covered initiative, which did a great job uh, getting people insurance in the community, now we need to focus on those people who are in our hospital system and therefore didn't realize that they were missing out on getting insurance because we had such an easy system for them that no one mentioned to them that they could have the advantages of insurance, which would work everywhere. We've increased the number of applications by our patients by 20% to over 23,000 applications uh, per month. Uh, and we anticipate that this is going to bring in $40 million in additional revenue uh, this year. We spoke about all of the work uh, on building insurance. We want to make sure that scarce subsidy dollars are going to the uninsured, not to subsidizing uh, insurance plans. We're on track to achieve over $200 million in revenue, which is, a, I think, a huge step forward. And the money has to go to patient care. Um, to me, that's, that's why we're here. And we've hired uh, 40 new primary care providers, streamlined our operations, um, and reduced our wait time so that today a new patient could get an appointment with a primary care provider within one to two weeks. Uh, we are working on making it easier to get specialty access uh, through eConsult. While I think we're headed in the right direction, as the chairwoman mentioned in her overall remarks, there's a lot more to be done, and I, and I get that. Um, and I, I'm not here to sugarcoat anything. Uh, I think we've made together a lot of progress, um, but there's a lot more that needs to be done if the system is going to be as great as the people in it. Um, the, the great thing we have is amazing nurses and doctors and support staff who really want to do the right thing and who really see their daily practice as a calling, not a way of making money. Uh, we need to get Epic completely implemented. Uh, we need to open up the retail pharmacies inside our hospitals. We need to get express care uh, working at all our emergency departments. We need to streamline our transportation. But we've shown we can do all of these things. It's a question now of scale, right? We, we have success of concept on every one of these things. Now we just have to make sure that they're available everywhere. Uh, of course, uh, the federal government continues to pose risks for us. Um, there is uh, a potential of a large Medicaid disproportionate share hospital cut coming up in the fall. Uh, the president's budget not only maintains these cuts, but makes it much worse with deeper cuts to Medicare and Medicaid. Um, fortunately, uh, a large number of people in Congress have said that the mayor's additional cuts uh, will not be allowed under their watch, but I appreciate how active the, this council is in advocating for our needs. We still await the fate of the ill Department of Homeland Security proposed public charge rule, uh, which we know could have a devastating effect on health and hospitals and even more on the health of the, our immigrant uh, patients and neighbors. On the, state, on the state side, the governor and the legislature are, legislature are still negotiating the final details of the upcoming state bill. We're working with Greater New York and other hospitals to, to get, advocate for the, the dollars that we need, um, and we will continue to work on that. I still, despite all of this, I, I come to work every day incredibly happy. I couldn't, there's no job I would rather have. I have a, a great group of people working with me, uh, and we think that it's going to be a terrific year. Uh, we're happy and proud to play a role in, in the Mayor's Guaranteed Care Initiative. We see it as a vehicle to build on the great work New York has already done, but really bring it to the next level where we bring in people who are currently eligible for insurance but are not on insurance 
and where we enable people who do not have insurance to really connect to a primary care doctor uh, in a meaningful way. Uh, we launch uh, this summer in the Bronx, and I'm looking forward to hearing more from all of you, city council members and others, about how, to, how we make sure um, that this program is a big success. Uh, I appreciate very much uh, your comments, Chairperson uh, Rivera, on the program, and we want to be good partners in working with you. Uh, so with that, I, I'm going to conclude. I'm, uh, I have uh, my wonderful uh, CFO uh, with me. Uh, he's go, uh, prepared to answer questions, especially of a technical uh, nature. Uh, uh, we have our managed growth expert uh, on the new revenues uh, and our uh, Dr. Patsy Yang, who is so capably runs our correctional health service because we know there may be specific questions on that as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks to the team for showing up today. So I wanted to ask a little bit about NYC CARE. And what is the process, what's the process going to be like um, to determine one insurance to sign up for under NYC CARE? So for us, the important thing is to get people signed up. We, we don't try to specify what plan they choose. We do talk to them about the value of a public plan um, and public accountability, which exists in uh, our uh, own Metro Plus. But ultimately, people get to, to choose where they're going to sign up. Do you have uh, projections, like an anticipated headcount for how many people you think will sign up for NYC CARE? Uh, as of right now, we don't. I mean, we, currently we see about 390,000 uh, self-pay patients a year. That's a large population of the uninsured and eligible around the city. Um, we don't uh, have a firm projection yet on how many people are fully disconnected to CARE, but we expect a substantial portion of that population to enroll in NYC care versus just being a self-pay patient in our system. But we'll come back with more specific targets as we move closer to August. You said in your testimony you're going to start in the Bronx, right? And then there's the rollout should be complete by 2021. So what is, what is the plan for the Bronx? What is, what is the plan to, are you going to expand outpatient services and primary care services? Do you have an anticipation of how many uh, organizations you're going to partner with to have these trusted relationships in their communities? Sure. So I mean, we, this is very much the stuff we're working on. Uh, we started with um, working on how many new primary care doctors would be needed, how many new specialists would be needed, and trying to accelerate the e-consult in South Bronx. Uh, we, we want to be good partners with the community agencies that have trusted relationships. We know that's especially important in the uh, immigrant population and we'll continue to work closely with them. Well, because summer is around the corner, so is there, are you gonna include CBOs? I, I imagine you're working with the current council members in those respective neighborhoods. Do you have specific neighborhoods targeted? Are there just a few details on the plan? So we sure. could know what to expect when you roll it out in the rest of our neighborhoods. Absolutely, absolutely. So I mean, the, the care itself is based at our locations uh, in the borough that we're targeting, right? So uh, we're currently uh, finishing up capacity analyses and projected targets for each of those facilities for how many primary care teams, how many specific specialists uh, in each location, which clinics in each location to prioritize e-consult in. Um, in terms of outreach, uh, we've started with uh, bringing key citywide organizations and other city agencies with deep ties to uh, groups in the neighborhood uh, together. So Moya, DOHMH, uh, many citywide immigration groups have been uh, advising us and helping us in the process. And the specific outreach uh, and partnerships, we haven't uh, determined yet which agencies we'll be working with or which individual CBOs on the ground. But I think the general message is that uh, we will be reaching out to anyone and everyone who's interested and anyone who wants to spread the message as uh, our materials get finalized and we have you know, key dates where people can actually take action. We're cognizant of people's great interest in this, but we want to be careful not to say, please come sign up for something when we're not uh, yet ready to accept people. So we're, we're staggering that growth as we go. 
So you're going to have every type of plan available, right? You're going to have all the information for people to kind of consume and understand and then make a choice, correct? Certainly. So I, I think that, you know, the general process is um, we currently, every person who comes in who, who does not have insurance, we screen them and try to counsel them to see what they're eligible for. Uh, if they are eligible for insurance, we provide them a range of options for which they can sign up. Um, and if they're ineligible for insurance for whatever reason, uh, they can use our fee scale. Um, that same general process will continue, though we'd like to use our call center and other options more to get people enrolled earlier. Uh, but instead uh, of or in addition to enrolling with our fee scale, people will have the option to enroll in the NYC CARE program. Uh, so it's a program for people who are ineligible for or cannot afford traditional insurance coverage. But the general process of trying to enroll everyone in the coverage for which they're eligible will continue at our locations. Is there a plan for if people choose to enroll in insurance that is not accepted at an H&H &H facility? Uh, currently, we, we people have the choice to enroll in whatever they'd like. We certainly let them know which insurance plans are in network with us. We do accept the vast majority of uh, Medicaid and Medicare plans and, and many uh, commercial plans around the city in our facilities. Um, we, you know, don't, we don't accept everything because certain plans are not willing to offer us what we view as fair rates and terms. Uh, I would like to have everybody in and I would like to have everyone offering us fair rates and terms, but having that negotiating leverage and being willing to say no if someone is not contracting with us fairly uh, is important to, to maximizing our revenue for managed care plans. But we certainly advise people, these are the plans that, that are in network and for which you will receive a very low or, or no bill at all if you, accept, if you select this plan. In, in your testimony, Dr. Katz, you mentioned that 340 new nurses had been hired. I wanted to know if you could share a little bit about the nurse staffing model by facility. Sure. Well, we're, we're trying to do our best to have a staff uh, model that works uh, across all the facilities. So the easiest to, to uh, follow would be in an ICU, the maximum would be two patients to one nurse. That's what it should be. Um, there should never be more than two patients to one nurse. Some patients really should be one-to-one -one nursing. Um, on a floor, um, it should never be more than six patients um, on a medical surgical floor to one nurse. So as much as possible, we're trying to do that throughout H&H. &H. Um, there are other categories like dialysis nurse or NICU nurse where you know, there may be differences depending on other staffing, but the goal <coughs> is to get to that. I think in terms of staffing, uh, on paper, we're actually like 95% of the way there. Where we still run into trouble is that one of the ways we staffed up rapidly when we realized that this was a, uh, an issue was we hired a lot of nurses who were working temp for us. And we thereby lost some of our temp pool. And we haven't fully built back our temp pool so you, what, what you want is you want a, every day to go in with the right number of hired nurses and then use your temp pool for the person who calls in sick, right, so that you have a backfill. So right now, we do run into situations where the last minute someone gets sick, life happens, someone has a legitimate thing and we're not able to backfill fast enough because we don't have a large enough, flexible enough temp pool. And we have some ideas about how to try to make the temp pool better. But in general, I think in 95% of the cases, we have the right model. Um, and if we would just have enough leeway now to be able to backfill, I think we would be right. And to the, in the 5% where we maybe don't have it right yet, I mean, this is an organization that never had staffing plans. So, right, like having established staffing plans, right, is a huge step forward. Um, that in the 5%, we're still working on places where we think that, that the nurse ratio is off and we're trying to, to fix it and hire, hire those nurses in. The reason why I ask is because we, we receive, so we're all, as a council, trying to 
uh, push people to you know, enroll in primary care and even go to our H&H &H facilities. Not everyone makes that choice, and I think there's a couple of reasons. One is uh, we get a couple of complaints about the wait time and staffing ratios, and it sounds like you're actively trying to address that. How it relates to, I think, the NYC care issue is that the, the system is so complex in terms of healthcare provision that people, I feel like, are steered towards certain institutions because of the level of sophistication and services. And, and some people actually really do trust their community-based organizations to get the information about where the best services are. And so as you're rolling out NYC care and you are marketing H&H &H as not only facilities that are addressing staff to patient ratios, but that are also trying to address your infrastructure needs, because I also think like taking down the scaffolding at Woodhull Hospital is important for how people actually see the facility. That's just my own personal mission that I'm on. But um, I, I want to know when, as you roll out NYC Care, how are you going to talk to people about H and H? Are you working with the community-based organizations? What, what, what is the plan, and how are you reaching out and choosing who they are? In terms of choosing who the community-based organizations are, we're uh, we're getting guidance from uh, members. And, of and I just want to say real quick, Matt, that because these are the these are the organizations that are working with the most vulnerable populations. And so I want to make sure that we're all working as a team here to bring that information as to you have a choice. However, you know, here's H&H, &H, here are all the great things that they're doing. And they'll, they, they, they've they been opening their doors to every single New Yorker since the beginning Ab of time. No, ab absolutely. And we, I think the, the number one message is we would love your guidance and, and support on that. If there are groups that have not heard from us on NYC Care or you think would be uh, good partners for us in that, uh, we need to know about them. Um, you know, I think we have a robust community advisory board process that feeds in information to us and suggestions about groups we should be working with and partnering with. We have a quarterly stakeholders meeting that sees dozens and dozens of groups come in and advise us on different issues around the organization. Um, our partners at Moya and DOHMH have deep ties into community and are advising us on groups that we should partner with. Uh, but our door is, is certainly open and if there are suggestions and people we're missing, um, we, we would like to hear about that and, and engage them. We want as many people out there uh, speaking with trusted voices as possible. I think the FQHC community as well is a critical part of this and our engagement with them and assuring them that uh, this program is not about breaking continuity with people's established primary care relationships. That's certainly a message we want to deliver and we want uh, other healthcare providers engaged with us and partnering with us on connecting people into this program if it's right for them. So FQHCs are, will be integrated into NYC Care? They'll certainly be integrated into the outreach and in, in the uh, discussions around this, and we want to partner with people on referrals. Um, you know, the, the, in the, the money itself for enhancing services at health and hospitals uh, will not flow outside of health and hospitals, but that's... But it, to the extent that people gain insurance coverage and use that insurance coverage at the FQHCs, that's great, and that's additional dollars to them, and so there would not be any loss uh, to any of the federally qualified health centers. I, I have a few more questions, but I do want to um, acknowledge all of the people that joined us. I realized I hadn't done that. Council Member Eugene was here, Maisel, Council Member Moyo, Council Member Ayala, and of course Council Member Levine. And uh, Council Member Levine has a question, number of questions. And Council Member Reynoso was here. It's just the whole team. Thank you, Madam Chair, for your outstanding leadership of this committee and of this hearing so far. And it's wonderful to see our friends from H&H &H and Dr. Katz. Um, I, wanna, I wanna tell you how uh, pleased we are with your first year and, and that of your whole team, and I've gotten to know Matt very well. Um, you've managed an incredible feat in, in, in containing costs and improving the financial health of the institution while also improving patient outcomes and doing it without laying off any of our critical staff. Um, that's not easy to do. And uh, I know it's a work in progress, but kudos to you for, for uh, big progress in your first year and to your team. Thank you. Um, I am extremely excited about NYC Care. It's a vision that I share. Um, and I just wanna make sure that it's implemented in the best way possible. This is our one big shot. Uh, I, I want to first make you aware that 
because the program has, has occasionally been described in, in really grandiose terms, um, sometimes such as New York City is guaranteeing health care for all its people for the first time, first city in America, that for groups on the ground that are enrolling people now in the exchange programs, um, there is a communications challenge because people sometimes think there is something out there that the city is about to offer. Um, they're confused. They think it's something like single payer or a, a public option that is better than what's available on the exchange. And we get calls into my office of people asking where they can enroll in the new single payer health care system in New York City. Um, uh, I just think it's important that we describe this in, in accurate terms. And I haven't heard any of you do otherwise, but uh, it, it, it is a challenge out there right now that I hear from people who are on the ground. Um, I do think it is critical that we are focused on undocumented New Yorkers, and it's imperative that we find a way for them to come in for primary care. I know you share that goal. You all have made that happen in at least two other cities already, um, and we need to do it here in New York City. Uh, as we have spoken about, I see our wonderful network of nonprofit FQHCs as being so critical, uh, particularly when it comes to serving immigrants. They're on the ground in immigrant neighborhoods. They have multilingual staff. They have cultural competencies. Some of them have leadership that's drawn from the same immigrant communities, and they've built up that trust. Um, and many are now serving um, significant numbers of undocumented immigrants. Now, there's a lot of challenges in doing that in the Trump era, and they're, it's getting harder and harder to bring in those patients, as you're well aware. Um, um, but they nonetheless represent an important part of the broader healthcare system of primary care to immigrants in this, in this city. And as I understand the way you design these programs in Los Angeles and San Francisco, and the way it was designed in New York in the wonderful pilot of Action Health back in 2015, um, they were integral and really the majority of the on-the-ground providers were these nonprofit FQHCs. And uh, as I understand it, they are not currently built into the plan for NYC care. I understand that you're working with CBOs for outreach and information, which is very, very important. But in terms of actual medical services on the ground, um, I understand they're not part of the plan as envisioned. And I wonder if you could explain that decision um, and implications of it as you see it. Well, well first, thanks for, for all your positive comments and about the importance of caring for this group of people. It is true that NYC care is not the same as uh, uh, Healthy San Francisco, and it's not the same as the LA program. Each city is different in its characteristics, and so whatever program we're doing, I mean, uh, my hope for here is that this, that not that, that it will replicate Healthy San Francisco or LA care, but it'll be the right thing for New York City, right? And that, that that's our focus. Um, it, the, I think you've well characterized it, that our goal is to work well with CBOs, but that uh, to date, and there isn't a fund of money um, to C, toward CBOs for care. Uh, we do assume we're going to be, uh, that outreach is a different issue, but that for the care itself. Uh, certainly that, from my point of view, that doesn't disadvantage uh, FQHCs in that currently, uh, if the person has Medicaid or, or some form of other insurance, they'll continue, my assumption is, they'll continue to go to that great place, and I would never want to disrupt that in any way. If they are undocumented and they're currently going, then that group, that clinic is currently not receiving any reimbursement for taking care of that person. Um, in this scenario, they're no better off, they're no worse off. One way I want to immediately make the patient better off that I think is a good model is by part of what the money is going to is to expand the capability to do e-consult. So one thing the, the FQHCs can't do is specialty care. Not their fault, that's by the mandate that it's a, that the enhanced Medicaid is for primary care. And it's very challenging right now for federally qualified health centers to get specialty care, especially for patients who are undocumented. And 
Uh, they can try to call around and, and plead with the doctor to see them, uh, or they can send them to H&H, &H but there's never been an easy way to do that. So then it's turned out into sending the patient to the ED, which is clearly the wrong way to do it. So I mean, I think that's one concrete thing um, that we can do with, with the FQHCs. Right, but um, I mean, first off, there is a risk to them in that they could lose some patients to uh, NYC care, which presumably will be marketed and uh, maybe even have one day have subway abs and other things that could draw people in. Um, uh, so there is something of a competition there for patients and potentially also for staff. Um, but, but as for your point about the cost, uh, I, I assume that their cost of service is no higher than yours, maybe it's even lower, I don't know, but you're at capacity in your primary care clinic, so you're gonna have to hire new staff and you might even need more space to rent, I, I don't know. Um, why is that any more affordable than, than expanding capacity at some of the FQHCs? Some of which actually have, have slack resources. Some of them are really sure. maxed out, but some of them um, could take more patients probably without having to hire up. Right. So the, the, the theory, and this certainly came up in the discussion, often it was posed as uh, how could you, with $100 million, you know, provide so much care, right? And the, the only way that the, the money works is if you accept that a lot of the costs of caring for the people we're talking about is already in the H&H &H system, just in the wrong place. It's in the emergency room, it's in the admission that lasts too long because the person waited too long because there was no way for them to get in. I mean, $100 million, if you start dividing it among you know, visits, doesn't go very far. So the idea was that, that if, we, if, in fact, we were able to provide better, then the dollars would flow. If, if, if the city were to make a decision to try to you know, more pay for visits, you would need a larger sum of money. But absolutely, there is, there is cost savings. I mean, when a patient lands in the emergency room as the first line of defense, it's terrible for their health. Uh, you're much, much better off to see them preventatively, and of course, it's more expensive. So, but you would realize that saving anyhow, if, if a person gets their preventative care in an FQHC, in a nonprofit, um, and avoids an emergency room visit, you still, realize the savings, so... Uh, uh, but I'm not allocating money. Uh, well, there'd be a spend and a save, but, but from the interest of the city, it, it, it could be a net, a net win. I, and, and again, you know, these are all good models, and you know, there are a variety of ways to do it. I think what, the, what I'm thinking, and again, 100 million when it comes to delivering care is not a huge number. The way I think about it is that the, there's going to be a savings, yes, but I'm not sending the money out. I'm keeping the money to make the existing system work at the level that I want it to work. And if I send some of the money out, then I, I'm not gonna be able to make the existing system work at the level that I want it to work to be able to deliver a higher quality product. Uh, but maybe there are other ways that in working together we can you know, affect the program. This, this is a longer discussion, which I, I want to continue to have. Uh, I would actually advocate, even if it costs more, to expand. Uh, maybe that doesn't come out of H&H's budget. Maybe it comes out of the city's budget more broadly. But um, I think it would be a, a wise investment to be in as many places as possible to reach as many immigrants in the most uh, welcoming and culturally competent environment possible. Um, but I look forward to continuing that discussion with Absolutely. you. Absolutely. And I'm going to pass it back to the chair now and appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think, I think what we're worried about is, is that the, these FQHCs will lose patients who, who aren't insured. And so we're, we want to make sure that, that wherever a person goes, if they enroll in this program, that they're going to be able to access either services or programs that they have consistently depended on in the past, or if they decide to find a primary care physician or become a frequent H&H &H consumer, that this is the choice is theirs and that, again, there won't be a confusion in what I feel is a very, very complex system. I think that this program was announced in very good spirits to do the right thing. 
it just added one more layer of, of nuance that I think is going to be a little bit difficult to explain to some folks. We want to be helpful, so we hope, that's why I'm, I'm kind of asking with, with this rollout in the Bronx, you know, any minute now, we, we certainly want to make sure that people who call our offices get the right information as to, to what their choices are. Thank you. <clears throat> so I, in, my in my opening statement, I mentioned um, the LGBTQ community, and I wanted to know, um, based on some of the testimony that we've heard from the public, we had had a hearing, Council Member Levine and I, specifically on LGBTQ services, specifically on transgender care, nonconforming care. Um, how many staff has actually been through an LGBTQ training in terms of understanding that sort of uh, the cultural competency? And well, well, John is going to look for that number. Okay. Let me just say, having worked for three systems, including San Francisco, this was the first system that ever handed me an LGBTQ t-shirt to wear with the H&H &H moniker on it, which I have. This is the first one that ever invited me to an LGBT uh, evening event to celebrate the members. Um, and it was full of both you know, LGBT members and you know, straight friends, um, you know, which I've never seen. This is the only of the three systems, all of the, whom have large LGBT populations um, where there is a clinic uh, at Metropolitan that does gender performing surgeries. Um, and I myself did the training and the training was not available in LA or in San Francisco. Um, now, that being said, like everything else, there is room for improvement and we are a you know, 43,000 employee organization and I certainly, you, you mentioned implicit bias, right? I mean, there is still, you know, I can say as an openly gay man, I mean, I've had, you know, been called things in recent years. I mean, there still remains bias in our system. Um, I don't, I do think that, that, and again, not because of me, because of things that were done before I got here, that, you know, Health and Hospitals has made uh, consistent with the city's council's leadership um, really great efforts around the training. I'm sure we could do more. Do we know the number? The number of unique staff uh, trained is 16,264. Okay. We also spoke a lot about having a, a liaison to the TGNC community. Has there been any update on that discussion at H&H? &H? Uh, starting on Tuesday, we're piloting a new LGBTQ community outreach program and hiring three community outreach workers. They'll be based at our Pride Health Centers and uh, we'll work closely with our central office uh, to do this work. So they're called community outreach coordinators? Community outreach workers is the general title. I, I, we, should, we could come up with a snappier <laughs> title together. Um, but I think that's that's I, I just in our personnel to, system. Yep. It doesn't have to be snappy. Just no, as I mean, long as it, people understand it, is sure, where I, is where I come from. <laughs> okay, community outreach workers. And were you working with the, some of the 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 activists and the the groups that were in the room who had made this a platform of? They, this is one of their major campaigns. A number of people who were here that that day. Yeah, I mean, I recall it. I think the first hearing we were at, uh, an activist spoke about this. We immediately got her card, put her in touch with uh, Matilda Roman, who is our fantastic Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer. Um, I think we're, we've been approached actually by national organizations to help with training around this and modeling what large systems should focus on uh, in this work. So it's an area we're very proud of. And any, any way we can improve, I know Matilda will, will take the lead on it with, with all of our support. That's great. Uh, well, I will follow up with them and see um, and see how it's going because I know this was a really big deal. So I appreciate that you're you're trying. Um, I wanted to, to pivot a little bit to correctional health services and also mental health services and how they're related. Um, before we do that, I want to turn it over to my my colleague, Councilmember Moya. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, uh, and thank you all for uh, being here. Just a quick question. Uh, I know that uh, you talked about some cuts uh, that we're looking at, and 
in terms of full-time employees. Uh, how many of the full-time employee positions cut were HHC employees and not consultants? Is there a breakdown for that? Well, uh, John, let's for that, let me thank you for your help for Elmhurst Hospital uh, with the financial support, including the ED. We really appreciate it. No, uh, thank you. Thank you for that. But they do great work there, and they deserve it. So, yeah, just the breakdown on the staff reduction from our, you know, measuring from November of 18, right? Our current uh, staff right. complement is 44,835 individuals. So we're down from November of 18 of about uh, 4,500 staff. Um, of those, right, 1,400 um, are in the temp position. Um, which is about a cut of a third of our total temps. So that's, that's basically where we've kind of focused the reductions over this period of time, as Dr. Katz has mentioned, was really in the areas of you know, non-clinical. Um, there were uh, some pretty substantial reductions there, um, as well as in you know, contract staff. We don't really measure contract in terms of FTEs, but we measure it in, in terms but of- But there's a breakdown that we can look at of, of how many full-time employees were cut from HHC yes. as opposed to the consultants? Yes, I, I, yeah. We'd be happy to provide that yeah. working with you in your yeah. office. Great, thank 230 you. 230 managerial positions. Okay, and you said those were through attrition and re retirement or what? Yes, the, well the temps not. Not uh, the temps, but the full time. Right. Any of the full time positions except managerial were via attrition. Got it. And the projected savings for fiscal 2020 uh, and beyond through scaling back staff, uh, do we know what, uh, how it equates to how many jobs are being scaled back or cut? Yeah, as I said from- And again, how many of those are, would be actual full-time employees versus uh, contractors? Yes, we, we have all those breakdowns, right? We have it by full time, you know, temp, as well as uh, type of, of uh, uh, position, right? So Got we it. can you know, send you a schedule. If we could that. just yeah. get a look at it, that'd be, that'd be helpful. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Well, thank you. So you, so I actually wanna follow up, uh, Council Member Moya mentioned, you know, the, uh, the cuts and things that you were doing to um, address the deficit and increase revenue and all the things you're doing to improve the system overall fiscally. You, um, in terms of what you mentioned last year, you had mentioned um, really looking at the space inside of the hospitals to, to repurpose it and everything that was underutilized to look at it in a different way. What is, is specifically you had mentioned Metropolitan Hospital. So can you give us some examples of what you're doing to look at how we can be smart in terms sure. of our finances? Well, thank you. Well, uh, let me start. So um, our biggest success, and I'll, I'll ask uh, John to, if he has the numbers, was that we are markedly decreasing our administrative space. I calculated how many administrative FTEs we had, uh, how much space did one need for that amount of administrative staff, um, and I think it was a 25% reduction in our managerial square footage. So we, overall $50 million savings as we're going into a new building. Um, we are taking all the separate offices, putting in the same building. We'll no longer have to manage a van, which is good for the environment, um, save us additional dollars. So that's been our most, our greatest success, is shrinking our uh, administrative thing. Um, I'm looking at this space, I think that it's bad for a variety of reasons to have empty space in hospitals. Uh, it is more challenging um, than I might have initially thought. The rules are tighter here in New York than they are in California about reuse of buildings. Um, we, we've had some nice things about land. So like we have some great collaborations with communal life and Kings for building supportive housing on land we own. And that seems pretty easy. Um, the, what, what's turning to be harder is what the expense of converting existing floors. So like specific to Metropolitan, 
Um, and I apologize if this is too much detail, you'll wave at me if it seems like that. Like for example, I was looking at a ward. Okay, could I make this into respite? or which, I, which is in need, and I could do that with com communal life. The basic, the rooms themselves work beautifully. Two-person rooms with a bathroom is actually perfect. The problem comes in that y in order to license it, you have to have, and you should have, some common space, right? This is not a hospital. People shouldn't have to stay in their room. You need a dining area. But the cost then of creating the dining area is huge because of the cost of renovating in a 1920s hospital where once you open up the walls, you hit every single code upgrade. So you're basically allowed to keep maintaining everything as long as you don't touch it. But if you touch it in what seemed to me to be even you know, as a non-architecture person, small ways, it, it, it invokes every single code. And so you wind up with a cost that is astronomical. So I haven't by any means given up on this, and I don't mean this to sound like excuses, but the, it turned out that the bigger immediate opportunity was save $50 million and shrink our administrative space. Uh, and now we're more slowly going through each facility. The, f the first one we actually did was NCB, looking at you know how, and the answer is in NCB, <coughs> you could rearrange things to have a lot of empty space for new uses, but it would be very expensive to rearrange things because they're all on different floors. So there aren't empty floors, what there are essentially is half empty floors. And so if you want to create the empty floor for the respite for the, you know, I've thought about residential mental health treatments, to empty the floor, you have to move the part that is there somewhere else. And that's where the expenses start getting great and it's complicated. So I, I'm going to keep at it. Um, and, and I'm we, open we to ideas. The vision. We, we thought the vision was smart. So you're saying that you feel a little bit, um, I guess bound or restricted by coding regulations of New York City on, I guess, just overall our, I don't know, obsession with real estate and how we repurpose it. I, I don't want, again, even that sounds more negative, you know, I'm not, I always like to look at the upside of things. I would just I say that, that we found an opportunity that was fast and yielded a lot of money. And so I put my energy into, let's get the 50 million. I think uh, now, having done that, I want to work on some of these others, some of these other opportunities, and that they're, they're harder, but I like hard things. The fact that it's harder doesn't mean that, that there is, a, it just means that we have to get smarter people, and I am planning on bringing on some additional resources around capital, because okay. I think that would make a difference. And, and, and again, our, our offer stands is that we want to be helpful with capital. I mean, I think that when it's a public system, and I say this about public housing, public health systems, and public transit, I think that we have to do our part, and this is all general infrastructure, so, so we want to be helpful to you. I am going to ask you about the new facilities um, that, that have been mentioned for for in terms of correctional health and those with mental health issues. But before that, I know that my colleague has another question. Uh, Council Member Levine. Thank you for indulging me. Um, I do have one more question related to the nonprofit health centers, which is actually not specifically arising from the NYC care plan, but the broader goal, which I think you share about better integration, uh, particularly for referrals to specialty care, which, um, I know you're working on expanding capacity among specialties across the board, including for your own internal refer referrals. And I know you've upgraded your, your computer systems to perhaps allow that to be more seamless and efficient. Um, and I wonder the, to the extent that you hope to make progress for um, outside entities like community-based health centers who need to refer into the public hospitals. These are patients who can't afford um, the more expensive volunteers. They're, they're coming to you. Um, but if a local clinic needs to refer to a specialist, it can be very difficult for that clinic to know um, was the appointment made, did the individual uh, show up for the appointment, is there any follow-up information, um, 
Can you talk about that challenge and, and what strategy you might have to help improve that? Yes, well, thanks for that. So yes, that's exactly what I would like to do. And we did this in LA, so it's, it's entirely doable. Um, and we did it on a low-tech platform because it has to be a low-tech platform because every, every clinic isn't going to have Epic, and they shouldn't have Epic. It's not the right product if you're running a community-based center. Um, so the idea would be that you would have on a simple ISP, Internet Service Provider line, be able to send in a referral and have that patient be seen and assigned a number, and you would get back sent the report. And because my doctors have no in financial incentive to see more patients, they would actually send the patient back, right? In some cases, specialists don't want to send the patient back because they have a financial uh, benefit from continuing to see the patient. So I think we have all of the right things, uh, and this technical solution can be done. Uh, my view is that a, a federally qualified health center should, their referrals should go with the same way any of my referrals would go in the system. And that's how it was in LA. We, we had no distinction between the federally qualified health center uh, referral for specialty care and one of our county hospital referrals. They all go through the same platform. They all get seen by, by need, not, not who you're doing it. So I, I think the, and I think that that would then, it would so relieve the FQHCs. Because imagine, you know, you take great care of someone and the woman develops a lump on her breast, right? You can examine the woman, you can do the mammogram, but then you have to find her an oncologist willing to take somebody with no form of insurance, right? Not, not, not something that's going to happen. So then, I mean, I think in, what people wound up doing is sending them to EDs with notes, right? And that's, that's totally wrong, right? So I, I think this is one of the most productive things we could do. And I think everybody would like it. That, that is great to hear. And, and, and lastly, um, could you speak about your plans to improve the pharmacy network within h, &H Because presumably for undocumented immigrants who are coming in to primary care for, through, through NYC care, um, uh, they're going to rely on your pharmacies because they're not going to have insurance. They can't go to Rite Aid. Um, but your pharmacies are, are fairly limited in hours and maybe in some other ways. Uh, could you talk about your plans to, to either grow the hours or the number of pharmacies or other services in, in that? I appreciate that. And, you know, that is one of the major enhancements. I mean, it's great to say that we take care of everybody. But what if you get an antibiotic prescription on a Friday night at 9 p.m. and you have no way of paying for it? I mean, just in the short time that I've been here, I've seen people at Gouverneur, both, I would say, insured because of co-pays and uninsured who were seeing me uh, as a drop-in. Uh, and when I'm like, why are you here? They would say, well, I went to the ED, I got this prescription, but then I couldn't afford the $60 for the inhaler, so I never paid for it. Never got the medicine. Happens all of the time. And again, not just on insured patients, right? Because you you have insurance, but they tell you $60 for the copay. Well, a lot of people don't have $60 for the copay. Um, so we have to have what, the capability to deliver prescriptions in the evening, on the weekends, uh, and we will. I think we'll probably, you know, we're still working on, on the solution. Uh, in LA and San Francisco, I did it through contracts with 24-hour pharmacies because it was just easier to say, you know, during these hours when we're open, you go here, and during these hours, you go there. We're not going to be able to, y y we don't have the scale for 24-hour pharmacy for outpatient. But yes, that's, I see that as one of the key improvements to the system. Thank you, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> so I, I wanted to ask, uh, and thank you for being here, Dr. Ming. I, I know um, we've uh, we've been here quite a few times, and we're trying to really be supportive of the correctional health services that exist. And there was a recent article in the city that said that CHS put out a call for what um, what is being called the thera therapeutic housing units and that these locked facilities would be located in or near three to six existing city hospitals. 
So I wanted a, an update on that in, in terms of which hospitals would they be close to? How is that selection process going to be made? Talk about the clinical part and then let me talk about the hospital part if, if that's okay. Um, thank you for your support always. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, in the jails right now we have therapeutic housing units. Um, PACE is an example for people with mental, serious mental illness. Um, we have units for people who have substance use disorders. We have units for people with complex medical um, conditions, like our diabetic unit. And we know that these are efficacious. Patients do better on these units. Our staff do better and are able to provide care um, uh, more easily and on and, and a more continuous basis and, and reduces the demand on DOC to produce patients to us. At the same time, we realized that there was a sort of a gap in, in or, or an area, a group of patients for whom um, their clinical needs, they're not sick enough to, to hit that clinical threshold to warrant inpatient hospitalization, but they also have frequent and sustained need for specialty or subspecialty services. And so the, the, the concept there was that we could actually improve um, access and quality of clinical care if, these if we could establish therapeutic units for certain classes of patients with medical, right. mental health, or substance use um, health concerns closer to the specialty and sp subspecialty services that they need. Um, we're, that, that is the concept. It's all about clinical care and improving quality and access. Um, you know, we're in the very, very preliminary stages of even exploring the feasibility of whether this concept can fly. Um, and, and that's what, what that is. And, and no, no facility has been identified that's not state. Um, I, don't, I don't think that the article actually specified that. We don't even know that this can work at this point in time. Mm, uh, and you, did, you sent it to nine pre-selected vendors, I imagine, with whom you have a relationship. That's what was reported. Uh, we just put out a solicitation and uh, responses came in Friday afternoon, uh, close of business. Um, there was a preliminary review, um, and there's some questions that, that back and forth that goes uh, between um, with a potential consultant who would do the feasibility. Well, one of the reasons I, I, I signaled to Dr. Yang that I wanted to answer the question about the hospitals is I want to keep everybody's roles very clear. Uh, Dr. Yang and her chief medical officer, Dr. Ross McDonald, are amazing advocates for incarcerated people. Um, and that's what I want them to do. I also recognize, and it's already been bubbling around, that there may be people in New York City who are not in favor of public hospitals housing people who were previously incarcerated. Um, and land use, being back here just 14 months, I can see how complicated land use issues are in New York City, and I want them to stay focused on what is best about patients, and I want to myself with you and the other bodies do the, you know, the community work around whether or not this is, you know, acceptable to New Yorkers. And you're much more experienced than I am to know what will work in New York and not. But I haven't, we haven't committed to any specific hospitals. Uh, again, I would say there's no question that, that the therapeutic model is right that this would be a great therapeutic model that would make both the delivery of care better, it would decrease security issues on moving inmates back and forth, it would be a better therapeutic experience. But I need to you know, know from the council, from the mayor, from others as this rolls out, you know, how people feel about these kinds of issues and what the, what the process would be for making a decision on where one would locate these and whether that's acceptable to the surrounding community. Will they be similar to the beds that exist um, at Bellevue and Elmhurst? Well, the, the beds is similar depending on how you, yes, but not exact. So Bellevue and Elmhurst are people who have to be at an acute care level. There's just no way they could be managed at Rikers. You know, and we, we, you know, so if somebody would need acute care as an outpatient, then if they're in jail, they should be in an acute care facility. That's pretty simple, and that's, that's why, in a sense, you can't argue it, although occasionally uh, state prisons will build acute care units in their jail, but you can't argue the level of care. It has to be that. Here, we're talking about people with intense 
health needs, but they're not actually at the acute hospital level, but they may be need to seen by specialists, you know, twice a week, say, or so that in an outpatient, I mean, I have outpatients who have to come twice a week because of their serious illnesses. You can imagine what that's like in jail, right? You have to go twice, and transports are not easy from jail, right? They're multi-stage, they can involve long periods of time with people in essentially pens. Um, it's a very difficult model to deal with the people who, you know, need a lot of care. So it's similar, a lot of care, but it isn't acute level. In, inside some of these facilities, are you facing any barriers hiring for CHS? For, for in, inside the, in the current system? Um, no, uh, you know, there, we experience the same shortages that exist at least citywide, if not statewide, in terms of psychiatrists. There's no question that the jails are a, are a challenging place to work, but equally on the flip side of that, um, particularly since Correctional Health Services came over to health and hospitals, it has attracted people from all over the country, the world, um, who want to, who are very committed to the mission, um, very committed to providing care to this population, um, which is for whom morbidity through patho level of pathology is, is tremendous, um, and they really want to make a difference. So we're delighted that, that we have been able to recruit uh, and retain people who want to do this work with us. So what's the vacancy rate? What's the vac I think it's about 10%. To per, it ranges depending on what the, the uh, uh, discipline is. But you have no barriers, no. right? No, no, I haven't. Oh, that's true. There's no, like, no, no. they're not under hiring freeze, right? right. Uh, Dr. Yang can hire all of her physicians, but as she says, uh, all of us struggle around psychiatrists. There are certain positions where there's just a sheer shortage, and so we struggle with hiring them. Yes, um, there's, there's no logistic or financial barrier to our filling our staff. For the, for the population with mental health issues, how is the correctional staff and the officers, how are they being trained? I realize that there's been a lot of discussion around Thrive, and I know that Thrive does not staff the city jails, but they do provide therapeutic programming, and, and currently their, their claim to fame is the, the mental health first aid and the training that is being provided to a number of people. What I read was that um, Thrive has successfully trained 7,000 correction officers in mental health first aid. Is that accurate? And what is, what is that training like? Um, what, what I'm aware of is, is that what Thrive does do is support um, crisis intervention training for correctional officers and our staff. So we're trained together to work as a team to do de-escalation de rather than um, letting things continue to, to rise and, and escalate, and that ends up with uh, probe teams coming. So we do train with DOC, Thrive does support that, um, to work better with patients, manage situations that are getting out of control or could get out of control, and, and take, every, take the temperature down. So, it, so the number, it, it hasn't been mental health first aid that's been specifically implemented inside uh, uh, the correctional health services? I, I believe the mental health first aid is a different issue. Um, that is not us. Okay, I, I don't, I, I'll I don't check know on that. Mm -hmm. That's what I read. Um, I wanted to ask about some other um, initiatives that are specifically for the, the women in Rikers and if you have any update on some of the metrics as to the success. So how, how are these, the following programs going? The, the opioid treatment program. That is running gangbusters. Um, we, we run the largest uh, medication assisted treatment program in jails in the country. Um, and with the, the additional funding that we received, we've been able to actually, I think, quadruple the number of people. Um, on any given day, we have over 1,000 people um, in MAT in the jails. You it's have 1,000 people daily in, in the treatment. system in yes. treatment? Okay. What about the number of patients receiving hepatitis C treatment? That's also going very well. Um, we have, uh, we requested a, a $5 million 
um, funding source and uh, we have exceeded our targets. We quadrupled the number of people who are actually initiated on hep C treatment in the jails, which is a very high number um, so because it's an opportunity where we are able to see them, diagnose them, and have the opportunity potentially to cure them while they're still in custody. Um, and for those few patients who end up being released before they complete treatment, we have linkages with health and hospitals facilities in the community for completion. So you said you exceeded your goals. What, what were the goals? I'm sorry. I think it was like 90, I, don't, I, I can get that to you. Um, Will you find out? That would be great. We're having, we're having, yeah. We're what about the goals. substance use reentry enhancement program? Sure. Sure. So um, we do discharge planning um, for various um, groups of people. This, um, for people who are actually enrolled in, choose to enroll in one of our uh, substance use programs, those already have discharge planning for people when they're getting released to jail, from jail to, to community treatment providers. And SURE is really sort of the safety net that, that wrapped around for people who do have substance use um, issues but chose not to be an active program enrollee in a formal program. So you have a, a, a number of programs um, that, based on what you're saying, is that not only are they being utilized, you're, you're seeing a tremendous amount of people. And I wonder about the resources, so that way you can not only meet and exceed your goals, but, but set even a higher, more ambitious goal going forward. And so I wanted to just go back to Thrive for a second. So I wanted to know, in terms of the, the role that Thrive plays in providing care for mental health citywide, considering that it is health and hospitals that, that takes care of the most acute mental health patients, do you think that more of the funds around Thrive could be used in, in H&H and &H and in correctional health services specifically? I think Thrive has been really helpful um, to us to uh, be able to, to extend creative arts therapy, and some substance use and mental health pr uh, screening to the youth, both um, uh, now at Horizon since October 1st of last year, the 16 and 17 year olds, and then the 18 to 21 year olds. But you know, we also do so much more and had done so much more and will continue to grow our services. So you see that Thrive is doing the therapeutic creative arts programming. I, al I also read that they're doing psychiatric assessments and substance use prevention for all young adults currently housed on Rikers Island. That's correct. With, okay. So with, with all of that, I, what I want to make sure is that you have all the, the resources that you need, and I know that we're going to be talking about Thrive a little bit more in depth tomorrow at the Committee on Mental Health Services. So I just wanted to get um, a better idea, and specifically more funding for acute care. And, and, and the reason why I ask is because recently, you know, there was the Allen Pavilion of the Presbyterian Hospital that was going to close, and that was an elimination of behavioral health beds. And so I, with, with certain hospitals actually decreasing the number of beds to serve some of our mental health, um, some of our New Yorkers with mental health issues, I want to make sure that the, the funding is going towards the programs that are actually working. So when you're saying, Dr. Yang, that it is like gangbusters, I want to make sure that you have every single dollar that is available by the city of New York to do what you do best. We think we do, thank you. <laughs> okay. So let me ask a little bit about um, the, the capital plan. Um, so we are looking at, uh, we talked a little bit about pharmacies, we talked a little bit about urgent care, and so I wanted to know if there was a price, uh, a plan to price out the urgent care facility that people are asking for at Gouverneur or in Lower Manhattan? So I can speak to that. I don't think we have a specific business plan uh, or capital request on that uh, express care currently. We're certainly looking at it. We've heard from members of the cab that it's of value. The first uh, two places, as I think you know, we rolled out express care are Jacoby, uh, sorry, Lincoln and Elmhurst. Jacoby will be next. These are three of our busiest emergency departments and, and the theory of the case there really is to uh, make sure people who are waiting in the ED a long time or going to the ED for things they do not are able to go to a, a, a different location. Uh, I think you know, Dr. Katz practices at Gouverneur and uh, you know, they are able to see people on an outpatient basis fairly well, but if there's a demand in the community, we'll certainly look at it. But I think that busy ED nexus is the first place we looked. Um, 
when I, I mean, I would ask for you all to, I mean, I know that's where you, you still practice. I mean, this has been an ask in the, in the community and um, I wanna just make sure that we can look at that seriously. It is, you know, it is a very densely populated area. I know that I represent Lower Manhattan, so I seem a little bit biased. But uh, when we're looking at the urgent care facility and how we're, this transformation of healthcare and its provision, I feel like that's probably the model that we're gonna be going towards more. I mean, how is it going at Elmhurst? Uh, we've had big success in, in both places. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I get in, Gouverneur would be a slightly different model, right? Because there's no existing ED in Gouverneur. On the other hand, I agree, Gouverneur is an incredibly vibrant center. And it's helped by the fact that, unlike some of our centers, it's a modern building where uh, the building facilitates the care, right? You don't, you don't have to do workarounds, right? It looks nice, people, makes people feel good. In fact, many, many people are surprised that it's a public facility, um, which is a sad comment, right? Because our public facilities should be beautiful. Um, but Gouverneur actually is. Um, so I, I hadn't myself heard, I didn't know about the, the urgent care, and I'd be happy to look at it uh, as a potential model for, you know, we could also, uh, it could be a way of getting people into primary care. Um, all right, that's a good one. <laughs> Did they have space, was there a specific spot at Gouverneur that people were thinking this would be at? You know, some, so when I was there, someone said, there's space for it right by, um, it's not, I, I can't think of the street, one of the side street, not Madison. Well, I, can, I can check for you, but people have said that the, it would be a, a really great location for one, and I okay. wanna be helpful, so we, I, can, well, we can talk go, about that. I'll look around, and uh, if you find out, uh, please tell us. Uh, I will, and again, I, I'll echo what you said earlier. I'm not, I'm not the architect here, but I'm, I, I, I'm good at implementation. So I'm good. gonna take well, the idea and need. I'm going to run with it. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about, um, in, the, in the capital plan specifically, in the preliminary fiscal 2020 capital plan, information systems only has funding through fiscal year 2022. Is that the anticipated completion of EPIC and its rollout? Yeah? Okay, that's great. <clears throat> also, um, I wanted to ask, why doesn't major medical equipment anticipate having any costs after fiscal year 2021? Okay, we'll have to get back to you on that one. Okay, and in terms of Kings County Hospital and the major reconstruction, um, is, is, is that all set and done, the reconstruction of Kings County Hospital? I'm sorry, is it also, oh. Is it done? Is it, is it is, done? Yeah. No, I think there's gonna, there's gonna be ongoing work there around the emergency department and uh, as we look at an express care there as well, there will be some construction work associated with that. You know, the, in Brooklyn, there's been this big move in terms of, of funding, um, not just the hospital there, the hospitals there, but the, the medical programs and services. And so I don't have any colleagues here from, from Brooklyn right now, but I know that it has been a, a major, major movement to fund the healthcare facilities there. And so I don't know if you have any specific updates on, on, some, of the, on some of the capital projects there, but I would love to check in with you all um, about some of the, the, the capital projects that are going on in Brooklyn and how that funding is being utilized. Great, let's do that. Yeah. Okay, great. So I did have a question I saw uh, recently um, in article about, uh, about malpractice and I wanted to know about the anticipated malpractice payout for fiscal year 2019. but I do have data going back uh, from 2002 to 2018, and it's on a precipitous decline over that period. Um, you said 2018? Yes. Usually you have to wait a certain amount of time because of the way courts work. Uh, I'm sure, so I'm sure, but do you have the numbers for 2018? You said precipitous do. decline. Yeah. So it, it peaked in 2003 at almost $200 million in FY18 
number of cases. It somewhere between about 150 cases and 2018. Are these are these numbers published periodically? Um, I'm not sure, but we could certainly make those available. What's the process after a wrongful death? The process, well, so anytime anything bad happens at a hospital, any hospital, there is uh, the medical staff by the rules of joint commission has to initiate a root cause analysis where the case is reviewed and we do the same thing. Um, we, we are trying, and I think this is a very positive movement across healthcare in general, not just H&H, is to do early apologies, early disclosures. I mean, uh, the world has gotten so much better. I was, I was told that as a, when in training that you should never admit that you did anything wrong because it would result in people suing you. And then there was a, a major study that showed that people were less likely to sue you if you apologized to them and disclosed it and offered a settlement. So we, you know, we're trying to practice that. We practice apologies. Um, we practice, you know, making early settlements if somebody, you know, clearly we've done wrong. Um, the what's troubling is that the language around wrongful death, right, sounds so horrible. Um, but that is the legal process. If somebody dies, um, that would be the legal process for going forward. But every case is reviewed, and increasingly we make early offers of settlements if we have made mistakes. Um, and we try to support our doctors in cases where we haven't made mistakes. And, you know, medicine is not perfect. It requires human judgment. And certain times people make the right judgment at that time, but when you know all the facts, you come to a different conclusion. And sometimes that results in a, in a favorable court settlement for the person who's bringing the suit. But every case is reviewed is bottom line. No, I, and I, I understand. I appreciate that. I, I only ask because um, I understand it's a very, you know, sensitive topic, and, and I, I do believe that your your staff and, and the doctors and nurses there really do work hard considering how many uninsured people um, they serve, people who speak English as a second language, um, the number of very poor um, the number of children that you serve. And, and, and I appreciate that you're also, you know, you try to be the most compassionate you can be, but understanding that competency is kind of what's been hurting, you know, health and hospitals and specifically trying to look into coding and billing and making sure you're doing that the right way. And so one of your focuses, besides the repurposing of underutilized space inside these facilities, which I know you said bureaucracy has been a little bit of a hindrance um, has been has been coding. Have people been going to the coding academy? Yes, and not only that, but we had uh, we just saw the data uh, two weeks ago. We've had a major increase in the uh, what is called the complexity score. So, because historically health and hospitals was not good at coding. If you looked at our patients, it made it seem like they were the healthiest group of patients that were ever in the hospital because they weren't all their conditions were never coded because a private hospital needs to code every condition in order to get dollars. But since health and hospitals was never focused on dollars, we never did much in the way of coding. Um, so we have found that once we uh, they did, uh, uh, John is, is showing me, there was a 10.6% increase in uh, the case mi mix index, meaning that we coded patients much more accurately. And when we did that, we had been previously saying that length of stay was too long at our hospitals. But once you correctly realize how sick they are, now it doesn't look like length of stay is too long. So it has huge revenue implications, uh, and there's still room to go. People love the coding academy, so much so that we're now doing a billing academy. Um, we think this is a great model with our uh, union partners. Um, we've had DC 37 and our other unions actively involved. It's a, it's a win for everybody, win for us because we get a higher level of work, win for the staff because they gain new skills. 
uh, some of which are, are marketable to them. Sometimes they get new certificates. Uh, and win for all of us is, you know, I came to work for county facilities. I want them to be great. I don't want to, you know, promulgate the idea, well, it's good enough for government work. Our, our facilities should be great, and they can be. How does that translate, the 10.6% increase, how does that translate into um, increased revenue? Well, because our yeah, and do you have payments are uh, risk adjusted. So we get paid more if, as we should on any value basis if your patients are sicker. Do you, do you have a number though? Oh, a number. Yeah. Do you have a number? Yeah, so um, I, don't, I won't have an exact number, but I can kind of explain the concept a little, a little more. Um, okay. So basically, every, every inpatient admission is, is, is relative to 1.0. And what Dr. Katz is saying with our 10.6% increase, our scale, our, uh, scale goes up to 1.13. It's in essence like a 13% increase on the base pay amount that we receive. And it, 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 it drives real revenue. We could monetize that and, and provide a number, but it's one of, the, it's one of I think, one more important things you know, that we're, we're doing at HMH. And I'll also just brag, you know, again, it's a little technical, but when you look at the average length of stay, um, you know, the, the expected length of stay across the industry for the type of patient we see is, is 5.2 days. And at h, &H we're at 5.4 days. And given how, you know, the challenges we have in terms of where we discharge people and the neighborhoods they live in, I think it's really quite an accomplishment um, that we're so close, you know, to the industry average. So it's driving additional money and we're actually providing, you know, better care. That's great. I want to just ask a follow-up because I see some um, some advocates in the room. Earlier in the hearing, I asked about the TGNC care and the liaisons that we were asking you for to be present in health and hospitals in terms of being able to be uh, that person to really go into the programs and services available. And you said that starting on Tuesday, there was going to be three community outreach workers um, beginning in this in this very role that that we were so vocal about in that hearing, where are these workers going to be? Uh, I believe they will rotate towards our uh, between our facilities. I was actually mistaken; it was last Tuesday that, that oh, they okay. began. Um, but they will be based at our Pride centers um, and will move between uh, different locations as needed. That's my understanding, but I'm happy to get you more detail on that. Let's get detail on do unless you know offhand all of the names of all the pride centers. Med is a pride center, Woodhall is a pride center. Um, so we'll 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 provide the names of all of the pride centers and how the how those staff are moving. Yeah, I just want to have a, an understanding and I realize that three is just the start and that we'll be looking to expand the program hopefully with some time. Um, because you did mention that you were working with some of the allies and the advocates in the room that, that day. So I just wanted to make sure that I knew how many and what you were expecting them to do. So you're expecting them to pretty much float and rotate, not just in the pride centers, but throughout the entire H&H &H system. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Just want to have an understanding so we could follow up on that. And I guess <clears throat> my, la my last question to you all um, is going to be about uh, state legislation and recently there was a proposal which we spoke about at some length about ICP funding and that formula and why it's important that the state impl implement the new plan that was proposed by this coalition of people from nonprofits and actually that you you yourself endorsed do you have any update on how that's going and how lobbying in Albany is 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 there any news well, as of uh, last night, we have not heard anything specific. Um, you know, the legislature and the governor are, you know, both negotiating uh, the budget. We remain hopeful, right? We continue to think we had a very balanced, you know, uh, plan that not only benefited H and H but also other, you know, safety net hospitals. So, it's with the legislature and the governor now. Um, you know, we continue to, you know, press. We would obviously appreciate any help we could get from. Uh, you know, the council members. Okay, well, you know, again, let us know how we can be helpful. I think there's a couple of things that, that come to mind that, that I, I feel 
you know, are, are urgent. I think this, clearly this formula and how those dollars trickle down to our facilities. I think the, the closure of Rikers and the, the borough-based jails and how we provide correctional health services um, specifically to those detained or incarcerated with, with mental health issues. I think the TGNC care is something that clearly we're very, very passionate about and we wanna make sure it's implemented in the right way. And of course, you know, being honest and transparent about your operating budget and deficit, and I know that you have projections and what's actual, um, but you know, when I look at the years to come, I, I am still a little bit worried about, about H and H. And I realize there are revenue generating initiatives and expense reducing, reducing initiatives, but um, even with the corrective actions, we're still seeing some projections of, of a considerate, you know, $400 million deficit. So I know that we all want to be helpful and I want to thank you for, for all the, the work and everything that you've done. And, um, you know, we're going to continue to advocate for you. We sent a letter to Albany, to, to Hasty, and to our, our Senate Majority Leader, and, and we'll continue to, to make sure that we're working together and keeping each other honest. Um, and so with that, I just want to thank you. Thank you for answering all our questions, and I look forward to working with you in the future. I see. Thank you so much. All right, so I'm going to call up this uh, panel. We have Max Hadler from the New York Immigration Coalition. We have Ralph Palladino, Vice President in, in Local 1540-9037, and Jerry Wesley from the Get Healthier Care Together, Inc. Inc. And if anyone else wants to testify, could you fill out a slip with the sergeant at arms so we can make sure that we get your testimony on the record? wants to start? I've been appointed. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Max Hadler. I'm the Director of Health Policy at the New York Immigration Coalition. I want to thank uh, Committee Chair Rivera for calling this hearing and for the opportunity to testify before the committee. Um, I want to mainly talk about the mayor's uh, announced New York City care program, um, but I first wanted to thank you for the letter that you actually just mentioned, um, supporting the Health and Hospitals community proposal on fixing uh, long-standing inequities in the allocation of uh, indigent care pool and disproportionate share hospital funding. We appreciate the letter to the leadership. We are also fighting alongside health and hospitals to, to make sure that uh, legislation is enacted either through the budget or outside of the budget process to ensure equity for real safety net providers. Um, but I mainly want to talk about NYC care. So uh, I just want to state for the record that at the NYIC we really value uh, the mayor for standing by immigrant communities and, and issuing a powerful message of inclusion and taking a really important step to create a program that has the opportunity to better meet the needs of hundreds of thousands of uninsured New Yorkers. And there are a lot of exciting components um, in our view of this potential program like navigation and coordination assistance through the assignment of a primary care home, a membership card, a dedicated customer service line, and a really clear welcoming message um, that encourages uninsured New Yorkers to seek care on an ongoing and preventive basis. Um, but as I think we heard today, there's a lot of details that have yet to be ironed out, and we urge the council, as you have demonstrated today, to provide really close oversight throughout the uh, ramp up of this project to ensure a transparent and timely rollout. Um, and that really sets the tone for health and hospitals as the program launches this summer. Uh, in terms of the amount of funding and the fact that $25 million are allocated for the upcoming uh, fiscal year um, starting in the Bronx and then ramping up to $75 million in fiscal year 2021 and $100 million at full scale, I think that um, considering that health and hospitals serves at most about half of the currently uninsured population in, in New York City, the idea that $100 million, even when it's fully ramped up, would be sufficient, I think, is, is really concerning. And um, I appreciated Dr. Katz mentioning today that to some extent we have to appreciate that a lot of these expenses are already 
in the system and there's a lot of uncompensated care that is already um, incurred in providing care to uninsured New Yorkers. I think it's really important though to think not only of the services that are currently pro being provided to people who are accessing services, but that if NYC care is successful, if the outreach is successful, the, the whole point is to not only to make existing services more effective, it's to bring more people who don't use services at all, many of whom are the communities um, of immigrants of all statuses, but particularly undocumented communities that we focus on at the NYIC into the system. That requires not only repurposing existing funding, it requires a really huge investment that the state and the federal government have refused to invest in our communities. And so we're really looking for the city to increase as much as possible um, on the 25 million this year and, and even the 100 million that will eventually be hopefully in the budget by fiscal year 2022. Um, and I think some of that funding would need to go to expanding the reach and the network of NYC care. As we talked about, we really think that federally qualified health centers outside of Gotham Health are a really critical part of providing care to uninsured New Yorkers and to ensure continuity of care for people who are already receiving services at FQHCs but need specialty care at health and hospitals, improving upon the uh, referral networks that, that currently exist is, is really critical. Um, and to that point, because this has already been done, I would also say that our, our, our third main point in, in terms of advocacy is really making sure that this happens on a more accelerated timeline than is currently proposed. This is not a brand new concept. We actually had a very successful uh, pilot program in New York City, Action Health NYC. There was a very rigorous evaluation. Um, this timeline can be accelerated because we've already demonstrated that this model is successful. So we don't really need time to, to prove that this model works. What we really need um, are uh, a full amount of resources to, to better implement an already proven model. Thanks a lot. Wow. Sorry, good day. <clears throat> um, and greetings to you, uh, city councilwoman and chair and my city council person. Um, my name is Ralph Palladino from Clerical Administrative uh, Employees, Local 1549, District Council 37. We represent roughly 5,000 employees of NYC H&H &H and also um, the uh, Metro Plus HMO, and uh, as well as uh, workers, eligibility specialists doing research uh, for Medicaid and HRA, as well as MAGI. Um, uh, we're asking, first of all, that um, we support thoroughly the uh, New York City CARES program that the uh, mayor has instituted, as well as his past funding of um, NYC H&H. &H. Uh, and uh, we think that um, the 600,000 um, undocumented immigrants who get care, as well as others who get care because of this program, obviously need the care and uh, have nowhere else to go but the, that institution our institution. Um, I also work in the system and I'm a patient at Bellevue Hospital. Um, there are 3 million immigrants in the city, 775,000 undocumented, and unfortunately there are some in the city, small minority but still vocal, that say that this is a waste of money because it's about undocumented immigrants. Um, like the Irish and Italians before them and other immigrants who came to this country legally and illegally, uh, they work to provide services, goods, and help build our city. They are taxpayers contributing to the economic and social life of our city. City controller Stringer has stated that, and documented that they estimated $8 billion in city and state personal income taxes to the state annually and $2 billion in city property taxes. They pay taxes, they should get their services. Um, so we support this and hope you will support it and continue to do so. We the also need to have the reach out to the state by the city council and others and everybody this week dealing with the state budget. Medicaid financing does not meet the cost of care. Every visit that go, comes into, say, any of our hospitals, there is a loss in a clinic of $150 per visit. That's about the money that there is lost every time. It's more than that in an emergency room. Medicaid rates really have not gone up in over a decade in a substantial way. Uh, in terms of the state as well, the disproportionate share, DISH funding is not fairly distributed and is ending and has never been fairly distributed. Um, so this money has to come in or what, how else will H&H &H be funded? 
Um, the larger hospitals with CEOs making millions of dollars in money, they're really for profits as opposed to even though they're legally non for profit, get the lion's share of the money, but they don't see the lion's share of the patients. Medicaid dollars should follow the Medicaid patients. Money for the uninsured should follow where the uninsured are. Very simple, but nobody in Albany apparently wants to get this, so we really need the city council to step up with along with the unions and other advocates to deal with that. <clears throat> as well as uh, the final thing is um, the need for uh, improved in, in language services, uh, especially around now that more immigrants are gonna be coming into the system. Um, and that's important because right now it's a, uh, it, it volunteers that are doing it, non-employee volunteers, sometimes employee volunteers. And our, our uh, client navigators in one hospital at Bellevue get trained on medical terminology, which is important. They also can do, uh, 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 translate documents. But right now, they're using phone lines, and they're using uh, temporary people, and they're using volunteers. Uh, and this is not right. So uh, we represent the interpreter title in the city. We represent the client navigators in, this, in the system that could be doing that work, as well as provide the information on healthcare programs, both in the community and in the hospital. Uh, that's what the title says is all about. So we ask you to support that and support any funding that they need in terms of um, enhancing the language issue. Um, at, I have to say that in the past I've testified about issues that were very negative towards H&H &H, with the idea is, of course, H&H &H has helped well, when it was, um, when it was um, Health and Hospitals Corporation. Uh, I had my life saved in the emergency room. Uh, I get great care. Never had an issue with that, but the issues dealing with access from the street, phones, things like that are still problematic. They have improved some, but not enough. That needs to continue. The, the uh, use of uh, titles that are higher paid, managerial, non-competitive sometimes, and, and, and doing clerical work still exists. That's a waste of money. That needs to end. Uh, and also the use of the private temps, which still exist in the clerical area without really dropping much. Uh, people who are getting access to patients' information because of that, that needs to end. There are ways we've suggested and we're trying to work with Dr. Katz suggested to move on those two areas where, and every other area of support for the hospital system. So we're asking to both support uh, and fund NYC H&H &H Cares and uh, look at the inter interpreter and client navigator titles uh, and proactively support in Albany the Rivera Gottfried legislation for expansion of the essential care health insurance statewide that mirrors New York City uh, care in New York, which will also help, that will also help H&H. &H. Proactively advocating with the governor and state legislator about increasing uh, Medicaid and reimbursement rates. It's important to demand more funding for the DISH program uh, oppose, um, and fair funding, I should say, oppose President Trump's wall building and restrictions on benefits for immigrants, including ridiculous work in requirements. Proactively oppose President Trump's proposed cuts to Medicare, Medicaid, SNAP food stamp program, which is vital for health, especially for children and elderly, and his attacks on the Affordable Care Act. And lastly, Local 1549 supports the nurses' fight in terms of fair funding, and fair, I should say, well, fair funding, yes, but uh, fair uh, and patient ratios, uh, fund, uh, staffing, fair staffing. Um, I myself have had safe issues. Safe staffing. Right? Safe staffing. I got you. Thank you. I stand corrected. Uh, I myself have had issues where I, I have had to wait three hours for a blood, blood, uh, uh, a, a, a uh, blood pressure test. Maybe my blood pressure is going up now. I'm losing my thoughts. Uh, the uh, <laughs> The, uh, because there was only one nurse on duty in the medical clinic, and all, another time in the emergency room, I had to get an extra shot of epinephrine, uh, which is, can be dangerous, um, and I, that happened because there was only one nurse in the emergency room. This has not happened this week, but I say that these things are happening. I understand thoroughly the issue about safe staffing. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ralph. Greetings, committee, Madam Chair, and fellow committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. 
I am Jerry Wesley, a transformation futurist and founder of Get Healthier Care Together, Inc., a 501c3 shared service organization. Uh, we're also a New York City approved vendor, and you can see all the various areas that we are authorized to provide services to the city. I am here today seeking budgetary funding in the amount of $1.5 million to help train hospital staff in resolving underlying and systemic causes of preventable harm and wrongful deaths that are occurring at NYC H&H, &H, either through poor care coordination, hospital-acquired conditions, misdiagnosis, wrong surgeries, surgical site infections, med medication and medical errors, in hospital falls, and other preventable harmful conditions. On March 9, 2019, a New York Post article reported that 468 wrongful preventable deaths has occurred at NYC H&H &H since 2014, with more than 400 cases pending. According to the New York City Comptroller's Office, between 2014 and 2017, the average annual amount that was wasted on malpractice costs at NYC H&H &H was $113,775,000 a year. The $1.5 million we are seeking to prevent or to begin to prevent this waste is about $374 per day per hospital is less than 1.4% of this amount. Since 2008, as you can see the chart below, NYC H&H &H has wasted over a billion dollars in malpractice costs. The 1.5 billion we are seeking will be used to implement care healthfully best practices for reducing and eliminating preventable harm at all NYC H&H &H hospitals. Our care healthfully intervention is a healthifying cure for outcome health of patients and families who entrust New York City H&H &H with their health and lives for helping to upgrade hospital star ratings from a one star to three to five stars over a two to three year period, reducing and eliminating burnout of an overburdened and understaffed workforce, also helping to restore the fiscal health of NYC H&H &H, who continue to bleed healthcare dollars internally from almost every organizational organ that generates revenue. An ongoing contributing factor of preventable harm and wrongful deaths is that 10 out of 11 NYC H&H &H hospital, hospitals have been labeled with an unhealthy one-star rating for 11 consecutive years with no public redress. The Centers of Medicaid Medicare Services five-star hospital rating system has labeled the following hospitals with a one-star rating. Bellevue, Coney Island, Elmhurst, Harlem, Jacoby, Kings County, Lincoln, North Central Bronx, Queens, Woodhall Medical, and Mental Health Center. The only recent two-star hospital in the NYC H&H &H system is Metropolitan Hospital Center located in Manhattan. The alarming factor that has been ignored for years that should concern us all is because a one-star hospital rating is synonymous with low value, low quality care, services, health, and outcomes that can lead to preventable harm and wrongful deaths. In this budget cycle, we are asking the Committee on Hospitals to join us in using your influence and connections to secure the $1.5 million we are requesting to make sure 
that we as a city and as a community no longer ignore the problem that preventable harm and wrongful deaths are inflicting on our community and no longer ignore the opportunity that is staring us all right in the face to begin to eliminate preventable harm and wrongful deaths now and for generations to come. Now let me say, we are not here to disparage NYC h and We love and support our community hospitals. But it does none of us, it does all of us, a disservice when people are dying from preventable deaths in our hospital systems. So uh, the time is now to take more proactive steps. I heard Dr. Katz indicate that how once a death is, has occurred, that a root cause analysis is done. But part of that root cause that we continue to ignore and have ignored for 11 consecutive years that predates Dr. Katz is that we have been a one-star facility with no strategy, with absolutely no strategy, effective strategy, to adequately upgrade the skills of our workforce. Now, we have been very successful at changing healthcare leaders. We have been very successful hiring qualified uh, people with very impressive backgrounds who also bring in qualified people with very impressive backgrounds to help them succeed. This has been going on for decades. But we have failed miserably at upgrading the TBACs, the thinking, behaviors, attitudes, communication, knowledge, and skills of our workforce to retrofit those TBACs for 21st century healthcare. And until we do that, we have not yet even begun or begun to transform New York City. A very wise man said, culture eats strategy, change for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And it's time that we face the difficult challenge of transforming our workforce for the 21st century. Thank so you. thank you for the privilege of your time. and your Thank you so much. Um, I guess Ralph left, Mr. Palladino left. Um, I just wanted to ask you really quickly, Mr. Mr. Hadler, when New York, when NYC Care was being rolled out, were you consulted in any way? Was your organization consulted in any way, considering your work with the immigrant communities of New York City? Uh, I would say not on NYC Care specifically. I mean, it's the since the mayor's task force on immigrant health access uh, convened over four years ago now. And one of the recommendations coming out of that was to create a direct access program. We've been advocating with many other groups that we work with regularly and with city council and with the mayor's office and with health and hospitals for something like Action Health NYC to be expanded upon and made a permanent program. We were very disappointed when the pilot was canceled after one year without any real publicly made plan um, to continue that and then so we we had ongoing conversations about what that should look like with groups all over the city um, but not on the the establishment of NYC care specifically well I know councilmember Levine and I would love to to work with you to figure out how we can make it as successful a model as action health and and to go even beyond that um, and, and Mr. Wesley, I, I didn't want to, I wanted to address your testimony. There are members of the administration here who I'm sure have heard your proposal. So perhaps they can follow up with you on, on the work that you want to do in our hospital system. So with that, I just want to thank you both for your testimony and, and just stay in touch. Look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to call the next panel, Andrea Bowen, Cecilia Gentili, Brianna Silberberg, Shay Huffman, and you all want to be in the same panel, right? Because that's you're going to be crowded. Okay, Anna Wythe, Elaine Mendes, and Esmeralda Matos. And again, that was like eight names. So, but I think maybe you know each other. Same handwriting. It makes a good image. 
Look at them just squeezing. All right. Thank you, council member. Um, thank you, uh, assembled staff. Um, uh, I'm Andrea Bowen, principal of Bowen Public Affairs Consulting. I'm a trans woman and coordinator of the Transgender, Gender Nonconforming, and Non-Binary, or TGNCMB, Solutions Coalition, um, which advocates for community-based economic justice and anti-violence strategies to support TGNCMB New Yorkers. Um, thank you so much um, for giving us the opportunity to speak today. Um, a lot of us to speak today, and uh, thank you for your continued advocacy for the community. Um, we wouldn't be here today if it weren't for your hearing back in the fall. Um, so uh, I'm joined by community members to present the need to you for three major funding items that we'd like to see as an initiative in the city's FY20 budget. Um, to summarize, and there are longer explanations uh, in a fact sheet attached to my testimony, we're seeking five TGNCMB community outreach workers, um, at a cost of uh, about $470,000. Um, H and H, um, as was noted in the previous uh, in the public part of the testimony, or in the previous part of the testimony, um, has been hiring for three community outreach workers um, for the remainder of FY19 that will support our community in finding affirming care. And we want to see this program extended to FY20 and expanded to five community outreach workers for better coverage across the city. Um, we seek uh, TGNCMB healthcare technical assistance funds at $59,400. Um, our community has spoken extensively and will speak extensively about specific failures in the healthcare system. Um, H and H used technical assistance funding to better train providers who need supplemental knowledge in working with our community, and TGNCMB organizations should be paid to provide this technical assistance. We know that there's training going on, but really narrowing in on specific issues is vital. Um, finally, outreach workers and TA providers will only have so much reach, so there must be funding for a media campaign at a cost of uh, about six. $690,000 um, to advertise these services and actions to our community. Um, our community can't wait for action. Um, TA providers, community members, and community outreach workers can pinpoint failings in the healthcare system for our community here and now, which will happen in this very uh, panel, and uh, make you know, we need to be able to make sure that the system is more responsive to us. So thank you so much, Chair Rivera, and uh, council staff and uh, council members, um, and uh, I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Um, good afternoon, Chair Rivera, um, staff of the Committee of Hospitals. My name is Cecilia Gentili. I identify as a transgender woman. Um, I am Latina, and I would like to talk um, about a budget proposal related to the health, um, uh, to health that would be vital for transgender, gender nonconforming, and non-binary people. TG and TGNC and B uh, people. And uh, I really want to thank you all for your advocacy around this issue. Um, it is my testimony here, but I, I feel better if I say like the story as uh, without reading. Um, last year, uh, I was feeling unwell um, for a couple of hours and my partner uh, asked me to go to the hospital. I was using the bathroom like every five minutes and you know, he started thinking like, maybe you have a UTI. Um, so we went to the hospital, right? Because it's very uncomfortable, it's painful and you have to use the bathroom all the time. So uh, we ended up going to the hospital and when we got to the hospital in the intake form, it was no way for me to express that I was trans. You know, it was just male and female. You know, all my documentation is as female, but you know, I, I think it would be better if, if it was a way to say that I was assigned male at birth and that I identify as a female now that we have saved a lot of uh, what happened after, which was very uncomfortable. Um, so I crossed male and female and I wrote transgender woman. So to give them a heads up, since you know the area that I was uh, feeling unwell involved my genitalia. Um, unfortunately, the triage nurse, I guess, didn't understand 
10 were having, and we had like a very heated conversation um, about my genitals, and she continued to ask for my last uh, menstrual cycle, uh, and she couldn't really understand why I don't have one. There was a lot of people around us. It was embarrassing. Um, it was inconvenient. Uh, while this was happening, I was also in pain. I was in extreme pain. That was the last thing that I wanted to be talking about. Like, you know, me and my transgender experience, I just wanted to see a doctor, right? Um, and plus all of that, it cost my insurance a lot of money, and I also paid $250 copay for that kind of um, humiliation. So, you know, it's like the hospital wasn't doing me a favor. I was just, you know, I, I, I pay for it. Like, you know, my insurance paid for it. At least when I go and get treatment and something that I pay for, I should get something that, I, you know, adapts to who I am. Um, health should not be a privilege of cisgender folks. Uh, we transgender, gender nonconforming, and non-binary people deserve to get respectful treatment and services like everyone else. So if you look at my testimony, I really support, you know, what uh, Andy was saying before about those three initiatives, having a community outreach worker, having a healthcare technical assistance that can help that triage nurse that didn't know that trans people are people, right? And didn't know about what the situation is. And like, you know, it would have saved a lot of pain and anguish, uh, you know, from my side and from everybody else that was waiting after me. It took a long time, precious time in the ER that everybody needs. So, uh, and of course the media campaign would be amazing to have. Thank, thank you. you, thank you, thank, thank you. you. for sharing. Hi, my name is Esmeralda. Um, I want to thank for having me here and hear me. Um, almost two years ago, I um, had um, my gender affirmation surgery and, and I had an incident in which I bled out and almost passed away. And I had to stay in the hospital for almost two months. Um, had several process, uh, procedures, surgeries for self my life. And um, by then I don't spoke well the language, English, and it was very hard for me because uh, my native language is Spanish. And uh, it was a big struggle uh, to communicate uh, with the nurses uh, who don't understand Spanish, um, what I was feeling or, yeah. And, and I'm here advocating uh, for language justice and uh, I think also it's important. And um, I have something writing in my phone. <laughs> I, I want to, Okay, what is it? Thank you. Are you sure? Okay, thank you. Thank you for, for sharing your experience. Good evening to committee chair Carlina Rivera, to the council members and staff on the committee of hospitals and to all present tonight. My name is Anastasia Weiss. I write for the Daily Dot um, as for, on LGBTQ issues under the pen name Anna Valens. I'm a 25 year old transgender woman from Brooklyn. Um, and I'm here today because I have a firsthand experience that actually happened just last month with emergency medical care here in New York City. And while it was outside of the public uh, hospital system, I think my experiences are relevant to what we're talking about here on this panel. So um, on Valentine's Day, I had a near fatal um, allergy attack. I am allergic to nuts and peanuts. Um, and my co-working spaces host called 911. An FDNY ambulance responded and took me to the Lenox Hill Greenwich Village Hospital and I was discharged several hours later. Um, while I do want to commend both the medical staff there and also the FDNY paramedics that helped me, um, there were several issues with the entire emergency visit in both parts of that trip that I'd like to address. 
So first, during my ambulance ride, one, of, one paramedic that supervised my initial onboarding made a joke about quote unquote male female and quote unquote female male transgender people. He also, this is not on the sheet you might have received, but he also made a joke about, um, I received an adrenaline shot and he made a joke about receiving a hot flash in, uh, his words not mine, my cooch. Um, now, I do not have a cooch. Um, I am preoperative in the sense of gender reassignment surgery. Um, so uh, these two issues combined were already immediately stressful to a day that was particularly uncomfortable for me. Um, and so when I arrived at the hospital, uh, again, this is not on the sheet, but also a paramedic then whispered into my ear, uh, have you had the surgery yet? Which again is not necessarily relevant to uh, what I was being treated for, which was an allergy attack. Um, and so when I, re when I arrived at the hospital, receptionist received my insurance info, which, has my, which had my then legal name on it. I recently changed it. And after inputting my information, immediately walked up to me in front of all these paramedics and other people and asked me if I was menstruating. This is impossible for me as, again, I am a transgender woman and I biologically cannot menstruate. Um, and so I had to out myself to this nurse after she had already seen my legal name and quite frankly was pretty obvious that I was transgender based on seeing such. Because the hospital registered me under my legal name, did not offer any option for me to put my preferred name or anything, um, nurses would check up on me by saying my legal name and entering into the room. I also had it on my wristband, um, which is obviously not very fun to look at for the whole entire time I'm trying to recover. Um, I would have to correct them each time, letting them know my name is actually Anna and explain that I'm a transgender woman, I'm not male, but that legal name is incorrect. Uh, this would become tiring and stressful on a day where I needed to recover from, quite frankly, a very traumatic experience. I believe these experiences are a microcosm for greater issues that are present for transgender emergency care patients, both inside and outside of the public hospital system. If both the FDNY and hospital staff were given the proper training they need for sensitivity toward TGNC patients, I believe these uncomfortable moments would have been avoided. I think also having a care navigator you know, accessible in that uh, situation would have made it easier for me to, to advocate for myself. I'd like to thank the Committee on the Hospitals for your time and for listening to my story. I hope, this provides, I hope this proves helpful in finalizing the city's budget and gives you an eyes and ears into what it's to be like as a transgender woman in the emergency care system. Good afternoon, Chair Rivera and staff of the Committee on Hospitals. My name is Shay Huffman. I'm a second year social work intern at the New York City Anti-Violence Project. And uh, I'd like to begin by first saying thank you for your advocacy on behalf of the community and its healthcare needs. Uh, I too am here in support of the funding request by the TGNCNB Solutions Coalition and I'd like to tell you why I believe it's so vital. I am a proud New Yorker and I think of our city as a progressive 21st century town. But as I testified last week before the Committee on Health, the realities of our transgender, gender non-conforming, and non-binary community members contrast markedly with this notion. During my internship at ABP, I've had the opportunity to research issues related to the community uh, and its health care. I've also had the honor and privilege of meeting with, listening to, and sharing stories of community members around their experiences in accessing health care. And I've got to tell you, the information I've gleaned the narratives I've heard reveal numbers and challenges that fall far short of what one would and should expect and desire from a progressive city. And these experiences cover things such as seeking care at hospitals where intake forms do not even include an option for their gender, identi uh, their gender identities. They've been asked if they want to check off other, for example. Uh, they've been refused medical care. They found themselves sitting in emergency rooms that give little consideration to their needs and rights regarding privacy. They've encountered physicians who are not culturally competent in their health care needs. And during an interview that I had with one community member, uh, it was shared with me that even in a supposedly progressive hospital, they had a physician who was freaked out by their identity and uh, would not even touch them. In another, the person shared how each prospective encounter became a trade-off, the mental and emotional well-being in exchange for medical care. It was just that stressful. And the term gender minority stressors is used to capture the experiences and expectations of rejection, discrimination, 
in non-affirmation that result from stigmatized social status. It's a stigma based on a person's gender identity only. Uh, gender minority stress is real. Its impacts are real. It often causes people to delay care or forgo it entirely. And of course, that only further compromises overall health. It increases the likelihood of substance use and abuse, suicidal ideation, and suicide attempts. And not surprisingly, research indicates strong correlation between gender minority stress and anxiety and depression. And if a person is a member of uh, more than one marginalized community, such as a woman, a person of color, an immigrant, the impacts are compounded. So I would urge H&H &H to collaborate with community members and leaders in assessing needs, tracking concerns, and developing any initiatives. And Chair Rivera, committee staff, I respectfully submit that these are all strong indications of why we need the budget items in our ask. I thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you so much. So if you, I know that there's two more people to testify. Nice to see you. Um, I wanted to just ask uh, your request to expand. Um, I, they, they have three outreach workers. You want to, so you support this, this effort, but of course to expand it to five as well as add, and I think you itemized this, Andrea, very well um, financially. Thanks. So you have the, the community outreach workers, you have the healthcare technical assistance, and the media campaign, and just expanding it from three to five. Mm -hmm. I think that's just based on what, what um, you all have shared today. I think that's very, that's the least we can strive to do to ensure that you can walk into a hospital or anywhere and not feel disrespected or misunderstood. And I, and I know that Dr. Katz is still here and as well as his team and they are listening. So I hope to, to work with you all to make sure that um, hopefully this doesn't happen to another person again. Thank you so much. And um, I just also, just to emphasize, um, you, know, um, uh, you know, I think at least having one per borough is really vital. Um, I think three is not, we, in, in collaboration with each other, we were all like, just three is not quite enough. Um, and people are all over New York in every borough. So, so I know they're in yeah. Staten Island too, you know. And, um, you know, we have people at the ready who, I mean, Cecilia is a masterful trainer, could be doing TA. Um, and, um, you know, uh, while we believe that the outreach workers will be amazing, um, I think supplementing it with the kind of media campaign that like we've seen with Prep and Pep and a lot of other things, the Unity Project, um, would really help our community know these things exist. So thank you so much. And, and I just also want to mention the language access piece. Um, Absolutely. You know, you just look at Elmhurst Hospital alone, there's over 100 languages spoken there, and so we are making sure that people can go in and, and have just a basic conversation, which I think is, is is normal to, to just desire and need. And, and that's what we deserve. So thank you for sharing your story. Right, and having an outreach worker who can help facilitate that transaction be vital. Thanks. Oh, we have two, two, oh yeah, good. Okay, you're here. All right. Good afternoon, Councilwoman Rivera, fellow members of the committee. My name is Elaine Rita Mendes. I'm a community, community member at the New York City Anti-Violence Project, as well as a youth counselor at the Ali Forney Center. Both these organizations work to support the growth and success of members of the queer community, especially the trans and GNC community in the New York City area. I am here, like the other members of this panel, to advocate on behalf of the establishment of the Health Outreach Worker Program for Trans Health. As a woman who began transition outside of the New York City area, I can say that healthcare here is better than other states, but it is not perfect. I started my transition in small town Pennsylvania and I had to prove my dysphoria was real. This could be a little challenging, as you might imagine. Many physicians still require this performance as they, as they do not operate through the informed consent access to hormone therapy model. Currently, as well, word of mouth between community members is the best tool that many of us have to go through to find affirming providers who will, who will allow us access that we need. It is not enough. When I was homeless in 2015, I was told to go to one of two clinics for my hormone therapy, two clinics in the New York City area. Later on, when I was pursuing gender confirmation surgery, I was informed that only breast and vaginal surgery were available. Insurance coverage later on allowed, inf insurance coverage later on allowed for facial feminization surgery to be covered. 
something which I am looking forward to next week. But the point of the story isn't that I'm getting my face done. That's not the point at all. The point is that I was lucky enough to ask the right person where to find the treatment. Luck should not be involved with treatment, though. I am not the first transgender woman to suffer from facial dysphoria, nor will I be the last. If I did not ask the right person at the right time, I might very well be stuck with this space for years. We don't settle for such lower standards of care for other conditions. Why is New York City resting on its laurels for regards to trans health care? What is celebrated as good and acceptable would be a scandal if it were the same low effort put forward for any other condition. Funding the Health Outreach Worker Program would be an important step, but that said, to elaborate on the earlier point, it is necessary that the city commits to a strong and robust awareness campaign. Without that, this program will be doomed to fail from the start. I trust that both lawmakers and members of the trans community alike would hate to see this become a failure. Thank you for your time, everyone. I trust the right decisions will be made by the council. Um, thank you, Councilmember Rivera, uh, the rest of the committee for having us all here today. My name is Brianna Silverberg. I'm a community organizer at the New York City Anti-Violence Project. Um, and with Andrea, I'm a sitting member of the steering committee of the TGNC Solutions Coalition. Um, I wanna make clear to you all today how necessary and important the requests and recommendations that the Solutions Coalition um, has come to present are providing outreach workers, technical assistance, and a media campaign to advertise the outreach workers and the services they provide are a dire need of New York City's trans community. Mm -hmm. When I was beginning my transition a few years ago, I was both overwhelmed and befuddled by the options that were ahead of me, particularly to get gender-affirming hormone replacement therapy. Community word of mouth was really the only resource available to me, and the people around me were telling me to go to Cal and Lord, and then I would be okay. So you can imagine my bright-faced disappointment when I braved the trip to the clinic that I thought would change my life and I was told that they were at overcapacity and that I would actually not be able to get treatment there. Mm -hmm. They then suggested I try to go to Aperture, who did let me sign up for an orientation, which was another two months away, which after I went through that, scheduled my first appointment, which was another three months down the line. All of this could have been easily avoided if something like outreach workers were available to the community and if they were advertised appropriately. The overcapacity at both Cal and Lord and Aperture, which led to some, frankly speaking, dangerous delays in my receiving care would be way less of a problem if patients actually knew that they had other options. We need to help people navigate the places that they can go to get care aside from the big name clinics. And these recommendations that Andrea has presented could go a long way towards vastly improving this untenable status quo. I know from working with community that my story is painfully similar to those of a great many folks most of whom only know of the two clinics that I named as options for informed consent care, despite the many other sites available that could help. Um, and with that, I thank you for your time, and I wish you all the best. Thank you so much uh, for your advocacy. I, I know that we have a long way to go when it comes to healthcare provision, but I hope that just on what was accomplished thus far, I hope that you all know that you own that victory, and that is because of you that we are here. Um, I thank you for thanking me, it certainly feels good, um, uh, but really you all have been my guiding star and um, I wanna continue to, to support you. So thank you for sharing your experiences and being very honest. I think that's how we're gonna get to where we need to go. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. I have one more, uh, is Leon Bell still here? Yes. Oh yeah, hi Mr. Bell, thank you for waiting. Um, hi, thank you for having me today. Uh, my name is Leon Bell. I'm with the New York State Nurses Association. Um, uh, I'm, I, I'm not going to take too much time. It's been a long afternoon, and I think I, I'm going to try to get through this in a minute or a minute and a half. But, uh, um, you know, I, I support fully the comments that were made by Max Hadler from the Immigration Coalition, um, our colleague, uh, Mr. Palladino from DC 37. And in many ways, some of the comments that were made by um, Dr. Katz earlier in the testimony today. Um, and I just want to sort of talk about in terms of the ongoing problems, the fiscal problems at, at uh, health and hospitals, um, which, as you've noted, are something that, despite all the efforts, are something that uh, we continue to face. Um, and also with respect to the uh, mayor's New York City care 
um, proposal, which we fully support, and we think this is actually potentially a, a great thing moving forward. Um, I think I, I want to sort of just address or leave you with three thoughts that maybe go beyond just the preliminary budget and the hearings and the implementation of the budget, but I think need to be considered as we um, move forward, um, both with um, you know, preserving and expanding the role of the health and hospital system and also implementing this exciting new program. Um, and the first comment or thought is, is that the reimbursement for the services that h and provides is insufficient. And at the end of the day, you can do all the, the transformation and changes and you, you can uh, cut uh, unnecessary expenses, but at the end of the day, the health and hospital system and the role that it plays within our broader New York City local health care environment, um, it's designed to lose money. And that's something that has to be recognized. And if you don't fix the reimbursement um, system, and that ties into the support, for example, for the indigent care pool, redistribution of money, the H&H uh, &H and community health plan to, um, to change the way that ICP money is, is, is distributed. Uh, but if we don't address those core issues, um, I think that at the end of the day, we have to recognize that the system will always be in financial peril. Uh, the second thing, and this is related to the first point, is that I think we also have to keep in mind the role of the private sector. Um, when um, Dr. Katz, for example, uh, helped to implement uh, Healthy San Francisco in, in an earlier phase in his career, um, one of the problems that was addressed by that program was the issue of free riders. And that's not just free riders in the em among employers who don't provide health coverage to their employees, but also free riders in the private hospital sector. At the end of the day, um, h and &H is increasingly left to cover those services that don't reimburse well, related to my first point, and um, is left to do it uh, in a way in which the, the private sector hospitals, A, don't share in the responsibility, and B, they actually steal the system's lunch money. They will poach patients that have um, the highest reimbursement rates or the types of procedures that pay well, and they will leave the uninsured, the underinsured, and the types of, of procedure, uh, procedures or services such as psychiatric care um, and other similar services that don't pay well in the hands of H&H. &H. And unless we address the role of the private sector hospital system and start to assert some sort of control or at least pressure on them, um, we will not address the system's problems in terms of health and hospitals, and we will not address effectively the issue of insuring the uninsured. So I think that's something that needs to be given consideration. Finally, uh, and co in conclusion, I think that uh, another issue is, um, and, and it ties into what the panel that just testified was talking about, um, as we go forward in terms of A, restructuring health and hospitals, and, and B, implementing this new um, universal coverage program, I think it's also important that we give a lot more thought and emphasis to the coordination of the efforts, uh, instituting some sort of planning. I think one of the things that came out in the, in the testimony today is that this whole New York Cares thing is really a sort of a by the seat of your pants operation. Um, and although we fully support it and we think that we, we look forward to implementing it effectively, there has to be some level of coordination both at the city level, at the industry level, ties back to my second point about bringing the private um, hospitals and making them contribute or pay their fair share in this process uh, and stop exploiting health and hospitals. But not only inclusion, uh, but not only coordination, but also inclusion of the communities, the healthcare workers, um, and uh, other, you know, stakeholders, to use that uh, often, uh, you know, overly used term, um, stakeholders need to be included in the process of sort of setting the direction, setting the planning, and looking how we're going to do both save the system and also implement this new program in an effective way. And I think that needs to be something that's also considered going forward. Thank you for your time. Um, I do have some copies of the testimony if, if the committee would like them. Um, and thank you for your support on the ICP funding issue. Well, let me ask you a quick question, Ms. Bell. So you said with the restructuring and with NYC Care and that it's a little bit uh, touch and go right now. Um, so, you know, I, I think the issue is that we're calling it universal health care and it's not necessarily universal health care. So are you, is the, has the mayor, and I asked New York Immigration Coalition this question, was there consultation with, with, with labor as they decided to roll out this plan or were you kind of alerted after the fact? Uh, not after the fact, but there was no consultation. 
Um, and my sense personally, I'm not speaking organizationally, my sense personally is that um, neither health and hospitals nor the unions nor the communities that are involved really had any sort of heads up that this was coming. We knew that there was an announcement was going to be made and, that, and we found out basically at the press conference. Okay, yeah, I agree. There has to be some coordination and planning, so I'm looking forward to working with you all at NISA, and thank you for, for uh, testifying. Thank you. I don't, don't think there's any more members of the public that wish to testify today, so with that, I am going to adjourn the hearing. Thank you. Hi, it's Bridget. Good to see you. How you doing? You work with Tyler. I do. Matilda.